And Father, we stand before you. We've put aside our day. We've put aside our busyness. We've, we're looking into your perfect law of liberty, asking you, please, to fill us with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, for your word declares, blessed is he who hungers and thirsts, for he shall be filled. God, fill us. Your word says that you will give us sweet honey from the rock and, and feed us with the finest of wheat. God, you are our daily bread. May we eat of the bread of life freely this day. We ask it in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Don't usually do this, but I'm going to name today's service WWW period. Not being a techie type of guy. I don't really, I'm not hip with computers. I mean, I know a little bit, but WWW period. Today, I want to, because we happen to be where we're at in scripture, WWW. The word, the ways, the will. The question that I get most often as a pastor is how do I know God's will for my life? How do I know? What does God want from me? Should I quit this? Should I move here? Should I? Everybody's, even, even today we're praying, well, what's, what do I do now? 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 Listen to me. Specifically enumerated in Scripture is the fact that you should receive good counsel. You should talk to your pastors at church. You should counsel with good friends. You should solicit prayer. But more important than all that, first and foremost, is consulting with God. Now, people always say, well, how do I know when God's speaking to me? Some people go one way or some people go the other way. Some people pull a scripture completely out of context. You see, God told me to do this. Some people pull it the other way and they go, well, I just feel as though. And since I feel that way, I'm going to do that. I was talking to a, one of my homosexual friends just a couple of days ago. And I, he said to me, actually, it was a she. She said to me, I asked God, if I'm not to be gay, then take these feelings away from me. I said, sister, that ain't the way it works. You got to fight the way you feel. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yes, everything is possible, but not everything is profitable, I told her. You can't follow your feelings. You have to find the proper balance between what the Word of God says and how the Spirit of God is leading you. But the only way to do that is with reading the Word. The Word is the key. If you are into such things as training, crossfit or weightlifting, you know, as one of those people, without good gas, the car don't go nowhere. You can train all you want unless you are properly using proper nutrition and diet, you're limited in what you can do, am I right? Same situation, guys, spiritually speaking. You come to church once a week and that's the only time you pick up your Bible. And then you say, man, I feel so empty. And then I give an altar call and you stand up. And, and it's great that you stand up and I have no problem with that. But if you're standing up again and again and again, it's known in the heart of the pastor. There's a person that is not washing themselves daily in the water of the word. People who are often wanting to get saved again and again and again are not reading the Word. They're not washing themselves in the Word. Thus, they feel so dirty that they need salvation again. I'm going to give you today the WWW, the reasons why you should read this Bible. I'm going to tell you about Scripture and I'm going to tell you some things that I'm sure a lot of you didn't know that are going to make you go, really? You're going to look at the scripture in a different way. Starting in chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. 
first W is the Word. This is the Word of God. And in a world full of books, we wonder, well, there's a lot of books. Why the Bible? Well, let me explain to you why there's a lot of books. There's a lot of books in this world because man deemed what he had in his heart so important. But God, whom apprehended a few men, for your information, this is not a book. This is 66 books written by about 40 different people. And then about 200 and some odd years after Christ ascended into heaven, he called a council of great men together and he told them to take this book, to take this book, to take this book, to take this book, to take this letter, to take this letter, and put them all together, thus giving us what scholars call the sealed canon. The sealed canon. These 66 books... Well, if you come from a Catholic church, there's 70 books because they added what's called the Apocrypha later on, which as born-again Christians believing in the sealed canon, we don't follow. There's a lot of great writings out there, and some of them contain truth. However, this Bible with these 66 books doesn't contain truth. It is truth Amen. in its entirety. For instance, you may not know this, 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus, speaking through the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, stated this, that there will come a time where people will no longer use money for goods or services, that they will have a number, and it will be placed on their hand or in their forehead, and they will find themselves without the ability to buy sustenance if they don't accept this, ready, mark of the beast. Now, a hundred years ago, they said, see, it is ridiculous. Come on, a mark, a, a number on your hand. They're going to put a number in my hand and my forehead. Guess what? It's upon us, isn't it? You already have a number. And as George Orwell said, well, Big Brother is watching already. Nobody thinks it's funny anymore. Nobody thinks it's a joke anymore. That's exactly where we're at. I mean, money's becoming obsolete. Anybody see the new hundreds? They look like Monopoly money. I wonder what they're going to do next. Maybe direct deposit into your account, give you, with, with the way things are right now, it'd be beneficial. We don't want to lose our precious kids. If we would just put a chip in them, we would know where they are all the time. That way, if God forbid anything happens, I mean, they already do it with our dogs. You mean the Lord Jesus said that 2,000 years ago? Yeah, he did. Let me tell you something about this book that's in your lap, in your hands. There are 300 plus predictions of the Messiah that was to come. And every single one of them was fulfilled. Even though 20 some odd different authors wrote he would be born in Bethlehem. He would be born of a virgin. He'd be born this. He'd be born that. He'd come this. He'd do this. He'd set this. He'd do this. This is the only holy book. And there are a lot of holy books, from the Koran to the Book of Mormon. This is the only one that bases its whole validity upon the perfection of its prophecy. Did you know that? That if there is one prophecy that does not come to pass, the whole thing is invalid. The whole thing. It declares boldly that it's perfect. Now, I don't want to pick on other religions, but there is no other holy book. It has that perfection of prophecy. Not one. This is what Chuck Missler calls an integrated message system, a love letter to you. How it can be so perfect, how it can predict. For in the book of Daniel, there is a chapter so detailed did he say when Messiah Nagid, when the Messiah, the king, would come into the temple, predicted from the exact day and time and going to the moment by moment, exactly when he predicted, the Lord Jesus Christ entered the temple. You might not know that, but you should. This is your word of God. This is your food. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the word made flesh. The Bible says that he is the bread of life. As a matter of fact, offended his followers one time, saying to them, 
unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you have no part of me. And they went, what? This dude's out of his mind. He's talking about cannibalism. And the Bible actually says that many of his followers left and never came back. And he shook his head, I imagine, and said, you don't get these things, do you? I'm talking to you about the Spirit, and you're so focused on the flesh that you've forgotten. This is the Word of God. And if you are finding yourself anemic, weak, if you are finding yourself without strength to say no to your feelings, if you are finding yourself hungry throughout the week, and although you leave on Sunday and you feel strong and you're going to do it, you're going to do it, you're going to do it, but Tuesday rolls around and you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't, I need church. When is Wednesday going to be here? It's because you're not filling yourself up with good spiritual food. And the first meal in that spiritual meal, on that spiritual diet, is the Word of God to read the Word of God, to understand that it's in the reading. There's something supernatural that happens. Now, can anybody stand up and explain why eating protein builds muscle? No, of course you can't. And I can't tell you why why reading the Word of God builds spiritual strength either. But it does. It does. Each and every day. Now, here's the weird thing, and I'm going to get a little weird for you. Sleep is a crazy thing. Sleep does this weird thing. I don't know. There's something with sleep. I can't wait to get out of here. What's the whole thing with this sleep? Because if I have a 15-minute nap, it's like all the spiritual strength is washed out of me, and i got to read the Word of God all over again. And when I sleep like eight hours, I wake up, and all of a sudden it's like, wait, I lived a pretty decent life yesterday. Why do I feel so weak and anemic? It's just the weirdest thing. Sleep is kind of like a spiritual vacuum. You go through sleep, it's like swimming through water. Now you're swimming, it just pulls all the spiritual good stuff out of you. And you got to wake up in the morning and go, man, I need some prayer and some Bible again, man. But so many of us, we pick up the Word and we go, yeah, just such a big book. I've never been a big reader and I read it and I don't understand what I'm reading and I... I get frustrated. In the beginning, God created this and that and that. By the time I get through, this one begat that one and that one begat that one. I'm just like, ah, I can't do it. Listen to me. Available are resources to help you. Out in the front lobby, on the shelves, we actually have, I wrote up my own personal Bible devotion. I wrote one up. This is what I do. I wake up in the morning and first I read the proverb that coincides with the day. Today is the 15th. I got up about 6.30 this morning. I read the 15th proverb. Then I went and read uh, the 133rd proverb, uh, psalm because that's where I was. I num- I, all of those are numbered. And every day I date one. And the next day I read the next one. Then I go to the Old Testament. I read a section of the Old Testament. Then I go to the New Testament. I read a section of the New Testament. It takes me about 20, 25 minutes if I'm, if I'm running through it fast. But I've read. I've spent a meal. I've, I've, I've had my spiritual meal for the day. You can get your, uh, you can do your prayer time and your devotion time. It should take you about 45 minutes to an hour. Oh my goodness, you know what time i got to wake up in the morning? Listen to me. Listen, if you find it's important, then you'll do it. If you find it's not important, then make sure that your life is lining up to that matter of importance. Well, I can't stop saying no to my desires, my urges. I can't stop doing this. I can't stop doing that. Well, you don't have any spiritual strength, of course. I'm, I'm grumpy all the time. I'm always upset. I'm, well, duh. You live in a crazy world. If you ain't filling up with the Word of God, you're going to be more than grumpy. You're going to be miserable. <clears throat> www. Next. Verse 13 again, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. The craziest thing is, when I read the Bible, I feel like God is poking around inside of my soul. I start to see things that I don't like about myself. And that's one of the reasons I put the book down. I was like, yeah, well, same to you, God. Never forget reading the Bible for the first time buddy of mine told me, you know, you need to read the book of Romans. It's a great book. I didn't even know what a book of Romans was, man. It's a Romans. Who are the Romans? Contents, book of Romans. I start reading it, 
And I'm just like, I remember being mad at the guy. His name was Kevin. I played softball with him. It's like, mad at him. What did you tell me to read this book for? Tell me about me. I'm going to tell him to read a book. It's how to go take a flying leaf off a dock or something like that. And I didn't know what was going on because I was new. I was new. I was a baby. But God was poking around in my heart and starting to point out some things in my life that he wanted to help me change. Yeah, the Bible does that. You know, Chuck Smith used to say what you got to do is you got to open the, your Bible up and in the first blank page, you got to write, sin will keep you from this book and this book will keep you from sin. It's the craziest thing. The worst day I had yesterday, the next day, I don't want to pick up the Bible and read because I know God's looking right through me. The Bible actually says that reading the Bible is like looking in a mirror and you see yourself exactly as you are, but then as soon as you turn away, you forget what you look like. No, that's not me. That must be somebody else. Guys, let me be straight up with you for a second. You didn't come here because you're so wonderful and you're so special and everything's so great. You came here because you wanted to change. Because something's going on in your life and you know you need change. You either can't stop saying yes to your personal desires, your relationship is messed up, you're fine. Something keeps driving you back here. For some of you guys that have been wanting to look for a while, it's, it's, the sheer, it's the sheer desire to help somebody else. God has just done me so right. I want to help somebody else. The Word of God, it's going to look right through you. And it's going to poke around in there. And it's going to tell you to change this or that and the other thing. Now, you could either go with it or you can run from it. But let me tell you, you run from it just so long because eventually you are who you are. And if you're stuck being who you are and you want change, Ah. The Word of God is living and powerful. It's change. It gives you a new heart, refreshes your mind, refreshes your soul, teaches you how to treat your wife and kids, your husband and your family, teaches you that God is equitable. I think for some of us, that's the, the greatest knowledge of God in reading Scripture. God is equitable. Listen to me. Nobody that hurts you is ever going to get away with it in God's eyes. And although you might be one of those people, but you want justice now. You want the judge to give you justice now. Listen, you give them up to God. God will take care of it. God is equitable. Nobody is getting away with nothing. Give it to God. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. W, W. Second W, His ways. The greatest thing about reading the Scripture from a practical perspective is you learn the ways of Christ. You see that he, as we just read, was in every position that you're in. When it came to finances, he was in your position. When it came to relationships, he was in your position. When it came to desires, he was in your position. But he chose the right path. And let me tell you something, and this I found out the hard way. When applying the word to my life, because he lived such an extreme life in such an extreme time, I have to water the scripture down so much to even make it fit. Anybody here, has anybody chasing them around trying to kill them? Has anybody here have people who keep coming around trying to trick you in your words so somebody else will kill you? I mean, literally run you through with a knife, stab you, cut your head off, put you on a cross. This is the way this man lived his life. And not only was he brave and bold, he was hopeful and secure and trusting. 
I'm not talking about getting your electric turned off like big flipping deal. I'm not talking about not worrying where you, I'm talking about somebody trying to kill you. Gut you. This is what they try to do. Story in the Bible says he, they try to trick him all the time. Some Pharisees came to him. They said, hey, uh, in the Bible, they tried to use the Bible against him. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scripture, it says that uh, you've got to give, uh, give your money to God. But here in Rome, we have to give our money to Caesar. What do you say? And he said, <laughs> you guys think you're so smart. Imagine trying to outsmart. Can anybody imagine trying to outsmart God? I mean, that's what we do. We try to outsmart God. God, I got this from here. I can take it. Can you do that? He said, bring me a, a quarter. He used the word denarius. He, he says, who's that on there? They said, it's Caesar. He flipped it up near. He goes, Hip. he says, and you give Caesar to Caesar, but you give God what's God's. <gasps> they were astonished. That's, it. That's all it took to astonish them. It was a sentence. And the apostles were astonished every once in a while. And he, he said, I mean, he used to say things like this. I and mean, he used to say, he says, that astonishes you? He says, let me tell you, what if you see the Son of God coming in the clouds in his glory and power, then what? It's the truth, guys. You could hold on to this word and it can rescue you from everything. It could take you through life in every way you can. This book will give you, you ready? Here's your word for today, a rhema word. Anybody not know what a rhema word is? R H. E-M-A. Every once in a while you're reading it and you might not know what it says. You might not remember yesterday's devotion. You might not understand. But every once in a while something just jumps out and grabs you. I remember being a young believer and I was reading the Bible for the first time and there was a, a woman in the Bible who was a prostitute. And it says that she wept and used her tears to wash the Lord's feet. And she took her hair and dried it. And the people I was standing by go, <laughs> he calls himself a prophet. If he knew who that was that was touching his feet, <clears throat> he wouldn't let her do it. And he said, you know, she who has been forgiven much, loves much. He who has been forgiven little, loves the same. And I remember that was, a, for me, that was my first rhema word. That was the first time God ever went, boom, hit me in the heart. <clears throat> And God's so smart. He's so good because it was a woman. And I'm like a man, you know what I mean? And I'm like a manly man, you know what I'm talking about? I don't identify with a woman. I identify with a man. I'm like a Peter. I'm not like a prostitute girl. <laughs> God said, no, you're just like that prostitute woman, son. And I've forgiven you much. And that's why you love me much. How do I identify? It's a broken down cry. <laughs> I couldn't tell nobody for years. I was embarrassed. There's a woman in the Bible that's like me. The girl's like me. <laughs> no, no, no. It's so my rhema word. And that's always been, that's been my, one of my life verses. One of my life verses. Some years after that, when I got out of prison in 1997, I got out of prison in about 1999. Brother from church, I'll never forget comes up to me and goes, oh, bro, I read something cool in Scripture, and I think the Lord told me to give it to you. I said, you know, I was still just young in the Lord, four or five years old, and the Lord, okay, well, you know, give it to me. He said, Joel 2.25, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. <laughs> right now, it already hit me. I walked away. I'm not a crying guy. I'm not. Ask my wife. I just don't cry. I don't gush. I'm not a... I went and read it. It was, my, it was my marriage verse. It was the verse God gave me for my marriage. Yeah, we'll restore to you the years. Seven years, me and her lived together, had a few kids, and just hurt each other as much as we possibly can, and lived in just sheer misery, just hurting our families and our, wrecking our children's lives. And when we started walking with the Lord, there it was. There was my word. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. That was my life verse for my marriage. It's my rhema word. You need to find your rhema word. You need to search the scriptures daily, it says in the book of Acts. Every day, just get on a regular reading program. Not cheating and going in the back of the book. And, well, I'm looking for a verse on marriage. Here, if you're getting married, 
Here it is. It is not good for man to be alone. You see, we have to get married because it says it's not good for man. You, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. That's cheating. That's cheating. Just get into a daily reading routine, a ritual of reading every day, eating the meal. Eating the spiritual meal. And every once, God's going to go, bang! It's going to twist you up, man. That's your rhema word. And you could hold on to that promise. And it'll never fail you. It'll never, ever fail you. Ever. You learn his ways. The second W. You learn his ways. You learn how the Lord Jesus was trustworthy. And he was trusting in God. And when they tried to kill him, he trusted in God. And when they tried to trick him, he trusted in God. And despite the fact that everything around him was falling apart and everything inside, and you could say like the Lord Jesus said to his Father in heaven, this isn't, this isn't the way. How could this be the way? Do you understand that? God loves sincere doubt. Don't think because you're here and, oh, but you don't understand, my faith is weak. Listen, Christ Himself had this moment of weakness in the Garden of Gethsemane when He knew His time to die had come. He had reckoned in His head, but if I stay here, I can do so much more. There's more to do. And He had this reasoning with His Father, and He wrestled with His Father. He said, Dad, if there's any other way, but he always ended his argument the same way we should end our argument. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Not my way, but your way. Some of you guys that have been through severe pain, I'm talking about the loss of a son or a daughter, the loss of a spouse, death on earth. You say to your father, how could this be the way How could anything good come out of this? You just got to hold on to the promise of God. In Romans 8, 28, he says, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. You got to hold on to it. You got to believe it. Because God never takes away anything he doesn't give back better. The Bible says, The suffering of our present age doesn't compare to the glory that we will see in heaven. It's like I've used this example before. It's like all of a sudden you get to heaven and you find out there's new ice cream flavors that you didn't know existed. For me, I believe like there's a different kind of cow or something up there. I love me a good prime rib, man. Give me a good prime rib. As you get to heaven, you find out it's like, you know how it's, you know, prime rib is really marbleized? And you dip it into the ujau juice. <coughs> Thank you. It's, it, I think in heaven, the steak is like marbleized with, with ice cream or something like that. It's like you can't even... You know the first time that you had caramel and salt together? The, you're like, every other ice cream sucks from now on. <laughs> That's how it's going to be in heaven. Like, the things that you receive when you get there, the, the emotions that, you, that God hasn't even unlocked in you yet. You know, the, 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 the doctors, the stock, scholarly docs say, we don't even use 10% of our brain power. That's because God hasn't unlocked it yet. But when he puts it, and I'm, you're like, oh my God. This is amazing. The depth of love that you can feel, the understanding and the trust when you're not weighed down. There's there's so much more. And then you could look and say, oh, God, I'm so sorry that I I questioned you. And when you spend the next thousand years reacquainting yourself with your past son, daughter, mother, aunt, generations, who knows? Your great, 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 great grandfather. Like, dude, dude. Really? Do you believe that? Because the Lord Jesus said that in Scripture. The Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, they said, God, there was a... They tried to trick Him. They did. They tried to trick our Lord Jesus. They thought they were going to outsmart God. They did. Sighed. They were so foolish. They said there was a man who had a wife. And before... He could have any kids, he died. 
And so this woman had seven husbands. They were all brothers. It says in, in the regeneration, in the, in the resurrection, whose wife she shall be, because they all had her. And he looked and he said, he said to them, you do err, error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. He says, you're so stupid because you don't know the power of God nor the Bible. For God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. He's the God of the living. It's like you always have these questions, and he never answered the questions with the answers we wanted. It's like sometimes you read, it's like, that's not the answer I wanted. Yes, I know, but that's the, really, that's the root of it. You don't know the scripture nor the power of God. But I just want to know, am I going to be with my wife through all eternity? Am I going to get another wife? Are we not going to be married? I just want to know. You don't know the power of God nor the scripture. That's not the answer I want. It's not the answer you get. Why? Because he's God. And he knows best. And his scripture can't be broken. We learn his ways. We learn his word. We learn his ways. And you ready? Verse 16, here's where we close. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we learn his, will, when we learn his word and we learn his ways, we then learn his will. And you know what his will is? You're just seeing it right there. We come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He says, come to me, all you who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Now, you notice there's no caveat there. It's not like, well, listen to me. If your life is really messed up through no fault of your own, and you didn't do anything wrong to deserve it, if you didn't mess up, then you could come to me. No. He says, whatever you've done to screw up your life, bring it here. I'll help you fix it. But God, you don't understand. I did this to myself. You told me not to, and I didn't. God says, stop doing that. I'm with you. But I shouldn't have slept with that. I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have took that. I shouldn't. I know you shouldn't have. And I'm with you anyway. Why? That's called agape love. You might not know this. Some of you guys don't know. There's actually five words for love. Like here, I say I love steak. I love ice cream. You know what I mean? I love my mother. I love my wife. I love my kids. It ain't like that. In the original language used to write the New Testament, which was mostly Greek, there's like five words. There's phileo. That's just my buddy. Lee's my phileo. He's my, he's my bro. There's eros. That's my wife. I eros my wife. It's a different type of love. God's word for love for us is a word called agapeo. Or the, or the, or, or the present tense is agape. It's unconditional, undeserved. It's the more you hate, the more he loves. The more you run, the more he loves. It's, it's like we are looking for a reason that God shouldn't love us. Or some of us are looking for a reason why God should love us. Well, listen, I bought two bags and, you know, I filled them up with stuff and I'm going to go to, the, go to the, uh, the convalescent home and that's why God loves me. No, he doesn't. He loves you because he loves you. Matter of fact, the Bible says that when you are at your absolute worst, I want you not to think about, but I want you to consider for a second the absolute worst sin you ever committed. Some of you guys, as soon as I say it, it, boom, it pops into your brain. I know for me it does. I know, ooh, that was a bad day, bad day, bad day. That's when God loved you the most. Huh? Yeah. It doesn't sound like... I remember, you know, stealing money from my parents while I used to have a... They used to leave, my parents used to get stoned and leave their clothes, and me and my brother used to get up. I have no idea why I said that. I forgot. I was so into the story. What was I saying? Oh, my goodness. That's not even, that's not even, God just love. he said, I love you, even when you did that. I love you. I think some of you guys need to understand that. And why don't you guys, why do some of you not understand it? Because you're not reading this thing, man. That agape love. The Bible says that he loved you first. He loved you first. 
Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, he said, and I will give you rest. Listen to this again. Is this like one of the best verses you can ever read? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You want God's will for your life? You come to his throne. I just, I have this vision when I read that. I always think of, of God on this gigantic throne as this great king, so untouchable, so far away, so majestic, so amazing, and yet there we are. And he sees us, and he's clothed in his royalty robes. He's got the angels flying, the cherubs, and, and just read the scripture, read in the book of Revelation, talks about the amazing animals that are in heaven worshiping God. And yet there you come lowly and filthy and dirty. And in all worldly sense, get that guy out of here. Come on, come on, come on. Get that guy out of here. And he does it, man. He throws down his scepter and he comes running at you. Get over here, you, you, get over. And you're just like, me? You! That's why, we, that's why we forget who God is. Because we think either God is, is He that doesn't know what we did last night or, or He doesn't care. And it's neither. He knows and He cares. He just loves us anyway. That's what agape love is. And you're just like, I'm blown away by this. I can't, this, I can't take this. I just have that vision of His crawling at the throne of grace. And we're coming boldly to the throne not now in some churches where they have the, what's called a word of faith movement, where you tell God what to do, they use this verse and they say, well, I come boldly and I say, I want to catch. That's not this. You're coming boldly because how dare you come before the king? That's the boldness. <coughs> You're coming boldly because the blood of Christ washes you clean, even though you don't deserve it. And you come boldly to the throne, he says, and you find grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. Grace is when you don't get what you do deserve, and mercy is when you get what you don't deserve. What a great way to put it. Grace and mercy in your time of need. When you need it most, he's there. He just seems to do that. He brings you right to the end. If you need a, um, a devotion, you want to learn how to read Scripture, because sometimes when I do a teaching like this, what could happen is you can, man, I really do want to start reading that thing. I, I really do. I will help you if you want. My brothers, come to me, myself or Austin or, or, or John Yancey or, or, or any of our elders or deacons, pastors. We'll help you put together a personal Bible study so you can start reading. However, you could also get, I have in my office, yearly Bibles where it gives you a, a yearly reading. My wife's been doing that for the last couple of years, so she, she wants to read the Bible every year. So, she, so we have this yearly Bible, and it gives you a different Bible reading every day for a year. Because don't let what I said to you today create this hunger that later when you leave and you open, okay, that's what I'm going to do, and, and you play Bible bingo. <clears throat> <laughs> Psalm 93, here's my word for the day. Don't do that. Don't do that. That'll create frustration later on because you'll see that the, 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 the bends and the, and the creases in your book are always the same. So you'll be re reading like Psalm 93 for like 30 days in a row because Bible bingo never really works that good. You get a nice, uh, you get a, um, a laid out, logical devotion and you read every day. Now when you read scripture, guys, my opinion, my personal suggestion is what I do. Read it out loud. So when you're reading, you're hearing yourself read. Because for me, my mind, because I'm so busy in so many areas of my life right now, my mind goes in so many places. I can read five pages and go, I don't even remember what I read, but I know I read it. But, oh, well, I guess I read it. But when I read it out loud, now an extra two senses. Now not only am I reading in my head, I'm reading from my mouth, and then I'm hearing it again because I'm reading it. And it always helps me have greater comprehension. Now, you're never going to comprehend everything. Like if I said to you, Joey, what would you have for breakfast two weeks ago on Wednesday? You're like, I don't know. It's the same way with Scripture. You're not going to remember everything. But it is in the nutrition of the Word every day that goes in. You get a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger. Some of you, I remember when I was, and this is where I'm going to close. You can close your Bible. This is the last thought because I want to finish this, this, thing, this thought in you. I remember being jealous 
Lee was an elder in the church that I attended when I got saved. And I used to go forward and ask him to pray for me all the time. And he used to tell me scriptures, read the scripture. And I said, man, I was so, how do you know those scriptures, man? How do you? So you you got to read the Bible. Ah, I, I want to know it better. I was, I was jealous of how he knew Scripture and I didn't. And I was jealous, and I started reading it and understanding a little bit, and I was jealous of everybody who knew Scripture more than me. Oh, man, I, well, why didn't I get saved earlier and learn this? Listen, don't do that to yourself either. You only need one Scripture. That's it. And you could hold on to that, and that's enough nutrition for one day. And then the next day, and then the next day, and then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, man, 15 years have passed by and this thing's just clanking around your head. Don't be in a rush. You don't have to go out to Bible college. You know? Don't be in a rush. You're saved. And let me, let me, and let me tell you this, again, please, from a, a physical perspective, knowledge of Scripture is not spirituality. It's not like the more you know the Word of God, the more you know God. That's not how it works. Some of the most loving, gentle, godly people I know are, are at best mediocre knowing Scripture. Now, it is great to know Scripture because in the knowledge of Scripture, you can apply promises to your life. You can pray the Word of God over people. It's a whole lot better than praying your own words over people. It is definitely something that the Bible says you can utilize when you get to heaven. Like, I have this picture. Now, this is not, this is not a... Um, don't build a religion on this, but I have this feeling that the Bible is like one book in God's, in God's throne room in heaven. Like you get to heaven, and, and there's one book missing, and you're like, wow, what are all those books in your study, God? Oh, those are the books that you'll be studying while you're here with me. Well, what's that one missing? Well, that's the one I gave you. Wow. Now, that's, that's not scripture. There, there's scripture that speaks of it. I'm just telling you, I just, I feel like that's such an amazing, there's, there's so many things in here. You listen to a guy like Chuck Missler and you're like, man, I hate this guy. He's always doing this to me, man. He's always telling me things that, it's always like the Bible's a wonderful word. If it's truly the word of God, then it should be simple enough for the ch smallest child to understand, yet deep enough that even the greatest scholar can't figure it all out. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I, I, I got you guys enough. WWW, period. Not WW dot. His word, his ways, his will, period. It's kind of a play on words. Sorry, that's all I got. Let's pray, please. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word, that we might learn and grow and hear your voice. God, I do pray that for the hunger that's been instilled in the hearts of those that are here, by the power of your Spirit, there would be those that need your Scripture for promises, for a rhema word, to set them free, to, to instruct and guide them. Lord, I pray that we would always have this church founded, grounded, and surrounded by the power of your word. God, I pray for each and every person that's here. If there's anybody here that doesn't know you, God, that their heart would hunger and yearn to know you deeper and know you more. God, thank you.